it's incredibly time consuming and uh, but it's very challenging and very satisfying uh, to be able to uh, uh, you know to be able to uh, uh, to get an uh, article published and uh, we have many other articles in the works we're publishing um, at a much faster pace in, in this coming year so it's going to be a lot of simple showing up as well. Uh, I've not met 
those folks that are here, now you're, you're from, you're from Connecticut, right? How are you guys doing? Okay, good, good, glad to have you. Now, you're yeah, great, great. Uh, now, uh, how many of you are from another country? Where, where are you from? India, wonderful. You flew from India? Yeah, but you're originally from India. You, 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 you're here. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much for coming. You're from uh, Sacramento. Great. You're MHED also. I love that program. I love so much about every specialty. Yes, yes, I, yeah, I, I love that organization. Those of you who have not joined the uh, HED program, uh, Mastership, I'm pretty sure you consider that. It's a wonderful experience. I made so many wonderful lifelong friends going through four years of that. So, uh, wonderful. Uh, who, who else is from another country? Yes, we're from another country. Okay, Canada. Let's give her a round of, give her a round of applause. A round of applause for India. And I grew up in uh, Singapore, spent quite a few years here, so I know some Indian culture. We grew up with, uh, with a lot of a lot of classmates from the other country, so wonderful. Anybody else from far away? All right. Yes. Montenegro. Wow, give him a round of applause. Okay, I'm glad you made it. Yeah, you're a USC student as well. So, yeah, okay, are you going to be, uh, what are you going to be practicing after? Uh, practicing in Chicago. Chicago, wonderful, wow. I've been to Singapore. Really, Singapore is a really great, great place. Yeah. All right, how many of you have been to Singapore? Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful place, okay. All right, we'll talk about it at lunch. <laughs> we have some great, we have a great Singapore restaurant right here. Okay, so. Now, do you see these cases coming to your office? Coming to your office? Tell me you don't see them. They age around about 50, 60, you know, could be even younger. I have a young lady in the 20s looking like that. Okay, so I would be treating her in the next couple of weeks. So, different ages, age groups. Now, as of now, what would you do with that? Give me your, give it what you know right now. What would you do? Goodbye. See you later. Let me do some classifieds for you. How many, how many would say, yeah, let me do some classifieds for you? With what, with what you can do right now, what would you do? Okay. But what would you do with the recession? What would you put the what would you put the gingival margin on your dentistry? Okay, so you can lose really long teeth. Yeah. And uh, so that would be a problem, wouldn't it? For some people. For some people. It'd be a long prep. So so the solution would be basically restore it with uh, cosmetics, uh, co composites. Or do long cramps. Would you recommend, would you consider referring the patient for treating the gum recession and then doing the doing the crowns? See the patient wants it. The patient wants that kind of a result. I want you guys to walk through this. Okay. So you refer what what if you don't do pinhole, what method would you use? Some epithelial connective tissue graft, right? That's the gold standard right now. And then you have others. You have the elbow derm, and then you have um, Vista and um, the tunneling techniques. So you have a variety of techniques, which are good. I I, I know a lot of folks who does that, and uh, the, the Vista technique after. And the doctor, I, I know also. So, so now, what would happen? Would you once that? First of all, if you did that, if you did the connected tissue graft first, whether you do it yourself or you refer it to another office, 
uh, you have to wait at least what six months, right? So you don't get the cosmetic results right away. Don't be delayed. And then would you be pretty much sure that, uh, or else you can do the crown press first, or you can maybe uh, estimate what the crumb line will be and put the crowns there. And then let the person who does the connective tissue graft, uh, however method was done, to bring it down to the, to the gum line. Right? Does that, would that always work to what a, what a, uh, what a gum line would be? Subgingible or, too, or just slightly supergingible? So there's kind of a quandary there, right? If you think this through, uh, thinking of the different ways you do it, you can see the problem. And this is why, it's, when you look at a case like this, in your office, when it comes to you, it's kind of overwhelming. Because you, you cannot feel comfortable in getting the results that you want. Whether you do it yourself in terms of the gingival correction, or you go ahead and, and do the best you can with crowns, or long crowns, or super gingival crowns, that you hope that you will be corrected uh, with the um, uh, uh, with the gingival procedure. So, but with pinhole, you can look at this from a fixed model. This is what you can do with pinhole, and that no other methods can can do in a way that it would, would do with certainty. Okay. So, so what do we do? Let me just walk you through first. Now, you'll be doing one or two or three T in the beginning, do, do three or four of them as, as, as training, training wheels, okay? I want you to be thinking about doing pinhole for arch. Because if you do one, two, like Sal said, if you do one or two T, you have to go three T forward, three T backward. You're practically doing half an arch when you do one or two T. You have the technique to do half an arch, the quadrant. In order to do one or two T, why not just go across the arch? That step is not that hard. Conceptually, it's, it's a challenge because you're not used to the idea. Okay, but you can do this, and that's the theme of this lecture of this whole whole day today. I want you to feel confident doing a full arch. You'll be doing a full arch in the afternoon on the cadavers, together with your partner. Okay, and uh, as soon as you you'll be doing it together, uh, the four of you. So so now. So now, let's say, with pinhole, what we'll do is, wait, this is the smile. Can you blame her for not, not wanting, it, uh, wanting it to be done? And it's within her, she wants to do it. She blew it from Texas. To get it done. You'll be amazed. Yes, go ahead. Mm -hmm. If you want to do, I, I'm glad you know this thing. Notice there's two sticking out. Well, there's a, there was a discussion with her, with this patient. Would you like to have all the downies done and bring it in? She says no. Then, then you have to do all the first. Yeah. Because otherwise, you're overcutting the teeth. If, if you, have, you have to tell the patient, I'll be overcutting this too. To make it even, and you're looking at the possibility of what? Rukana. Okay, I have to say that. But she says, I don't care, to do it. Besides, I don't want to fly back to Texas and I have it done. So, so she, now you'd be amazed, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, that people will come to you from far off when they know you're doing it. Now, give me, let, me, let me see a show of hands. How many have had calls to your office by patients looking for pinhole. Okay? It's going to be more and more. And uh, they want that procedure because, you know, but what they read is more attractive to them. And patients who see that you offer that also, along with other alternatives, and they'll come to you with a, which, which method they decide on, and you can, you can offer. So if you're really doing wonderful Granting procedures, you know, just one more thing, you know, I'm a vegetarian, one more alternative to offer the patient. So, 
And that's why you're here. All right. So just to show you, this is the this is the after. It did take us nine months. Okay. And, we, and with that, with pinhole, because the way we do it, we're pretty confident of getting good gum line results. But there's one tooth that's out longer than the other. I see my friend Dr. Takahana and uh, my, 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 my uh, schoolmate. Would you, would, would you recognize that from USC? Yeah. Dr. Takahana, I have a little, I mean, Sheikh Takahana. Let's give a round of applause. <laughs> All right. All right. With him. All right, very good. So I asked him to come and, and, and uh, attend and uh, give me his ideas of how I can improve. So now, here it goes. So how do we do that? Prep the teeth first. Prep the teeth and did the pinhole and draw the gum line down to here. Now, there's no margins. There's no shoulders. It's all it's all smooth, all the way to the gum line. Because I don't know where the shoulder is going to be later. All right. So where I put the shoulder would be where the gum line would be after six months. So prep the teeth. Then the pinhole brought it, brought it all down. And then I had these uh, temporaries. Not the greatest, but it's still better than it was before. Like this. Yeah. So it's still better, but fish and walk down, it, it looked pretty good. I, I kept my prep a little super heated over here. So this is the next day. You see those sutures? Right? This is the big difference between the suture techniques and pinhole. Pinhole is dis distinctive for what? No incisions and no sutures. It looks good, right? Doesn't look perfect, but still quite a big difference. One week, you see how we overcompensate. We make it a lot thicker, a lot further down. And then uh, there, this is three weeks, we healing. Six weeks, we had to add a little composite here. We have to make it look better. Still, this is better than than here. See that? So we get the results that the patient is looking for. We are able to give the results instantly. Instantly, we we need one appointment. Five months. There's some some more recession. And then eventually, then we, we finish. Now this is, we finish, you see the crowns, at the end of nine months, and this is the 30, 35th month. All right. These are the crowns. The gum line's pretty good. Here, it's pretty good. This is a new smile line. New smile. And that's that. Okay. So, any questions about that? This is what the end, end, end point will be for Pinto. Okay? And this is uh, something you can do now uh, just to add a little bit more gravy to this approach. Uh, Dr. Zahidi, Dr. Zahidi, the chief actually the writer here, was my radiologist. I do a CBCT before every surgery. And then I, I, a few years later, two or three years later, maybe a year later, if, there's, if, if it's necessary, we'll do another one. And she noticed that we were seeing, that she was seeing bone gain post-operatively. So she decided to hand it over to the resident. And so she and the resident did a study and uh, found out that we viewed some 20, 200 cases, and ended up that some cases gain a lot of bone, some cases lose a little bit of bone, but on the average, after surgery, there was no loss of bone. You figure you do all this work to be loss of bone, but actually there was a positive gain, not a whole lot, but still on the average half a millimeter. So you show that there's no bone loss. So now, 
So what I do with this case is, I send the case I just did, a lady with all those teeth and uh, with all those crowns, I send it in for the measure at the, at the end of 35 months. I say, is there any bone gain, let's say, on tooth number four? It started with 9.6, ended up with 10.0. Tooth number six had no bone. I even called her up yesterday. I said, you didn't say there's zero bone. She says, there's no bone there, as far as I can see. OK? On this patient, she gained eight millimeters of bone in the 35 minutes. Now, tooth number seven at 8.9, 9.5, 7.7 on 10, 10.0. 9.6 on the lower 22, 11.5 after 35 months. 7.2, 9.4, 7 7.7, 8.8. So when you, when you show bone gain, uh, we, 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 we didn't include that. But we may be able to find another follow-up study on this and just talk about bone gain. So, so, so there is a possibility of bone gain. So I would like to encourage everybody, before you, if you have a cone beam already, do a cone beam before you do the window. And then you, you, then you, can, then you can actually figure out how much bone you have. If you have very little bone, you have to be very careful. Let's say you saw that the root is actually sticking out of the bone. You have to be very careful to actually not do surgery here. But once in a while you may have that, you have to be very careful because you may end up with one. For that, with an abscess, the preapical abscess. So, so, but, but do know what you're doing. Also, in case presentation, you know, you have you have lost this much bone on on, on the facial. We we don't want you to lose any more bone. Isn't that the goal? You only you only have half the bone left. Seven point two. That's not a whole lot of bone. So we want this tooth to stay in your in in, in your mouth long term. Hopefully the rest of your life. So what can we do to protect this bone? That's what we do, pinball. Okay? So so there is a case to be made that you can get better uh, case acceptance when you can show the cross section of the amount of bone that the patient has. To begin with. And then you can say, well, since our goal is to save the tooth and and give and create a better seal uh, with the gums. Thicken, the, uh, widen the zone of attached gingiva. Okay. So now, so now, uh, so now, if the gum line didn't go all the way up, it does not become such a critical issue because our main goal is to save the tooth for long term. So especially on lowest, sometimes we are not as predictable. If you, especially if you lost the color and we don't have the same high percentage of predictable full coverage. So, so this is another uh, something I want to really tell you about, encouraging you to come to be whenever possible. Okay, I, I, when I was doing this case uh, yesterday, I remember Margarita. Margarita came in to me in 2005. She has this plastic filling on, on the uh, on the abutment of a three in the bridge that goes from five it goes on it goes from uh, 12 13 14 this is the pocket here so, so I was very enthusiastic about pindle at the time so I said I can't get, I can't guarantee anything but what if I do pindle for you you think you have to do a bridge right so she said okay let's do it so I did pindle and this is like 11 years later. The gums have grown underneath the margin. Pretty healthy, no inflammation. So you can do a lot of interesting things with that with pinhole, including implants. Okay? No guarantee, but we do see wonderful results quite, quite a bit of the time. All right? So now, 2015, when she came in, I took another x-ray. No decay. Not bad. Right? So there's different ways to apply pinhole, depending on how ingenious you want, you want to get. And she was 87 at this time. 
She'll be 94 this year, but we was trying to get hold of her, but we couldn't reach her yet. Okay, so before I get into the substance of the lecture today, this patient is Judy. And uh, Judy had, had really done the lower upper right side with us in class. So now this will be her second pinhole uh, surgery. And uh, so what do we do for pre-op? Because we, we do a CBCT and FMX. We always get a report from the radiologist as to, as to what, she, what she sees, what the radiologist sees in terms of what's obvious. Is there bone loss? What degree of bone loss? Is it early? Uh, is it moderate? Uh, is, it, is it light? Is it, is it heavy? Where do we have, or, or where do we have bone where we don't have bone? And uh, is there evidence of bruxism? If I, if I observe signs of bruxism, I'm going to be looking at that. I want her to tell me what she sees. Is there a sense of who's aware? I want her to put it on paper. Because it's hard to tell the patient. Sometimes the patient says, I think you grind your teeth at night during the daytime. I never do that. Right? It's nice to have something pretty written. Yeah, and this is who's aware. The thickening of the um, lamina dura, the thickening of the PDL, and uh, the what they see in the TMJ is consistent with the with the bruxism problem. So you have that in writing by a third neutral party. It serves to uh, be more uh, be more convincing to the patient when you talk about possibly uh, recommending a uh, a uh, a uh, a orthotic appliance that can treat the that can address the bruxism problem. Why do we why do we want to address the bruxism problem? What is that going to do with pinhole? Some people will say abrasions are not caused by bruxism. Some people will say yes. But we don't have to go into that. Would bruxism impede or aid in the, in the healing of, of pinhole procedures? You have micro trauma on the teeth. Do you not want to minimize that? So an orthotic appliance would be appropriate just as a, uh, just as a means to minimize micro trauma and assist in long term healing of the teeth. So, uh, so I will give the patient a chance to, to think about getting orthotic appliance. So we do do a DNA bacteriological study. I found it to be very useful in, in assessing what kind of bacteriological uh, microbiome am I, am I looking at here? Is it high or is it low? I see very healthy patients like this patient you see today. Very, very high bacterial count. And so we're going to put her on antibiotics and we had that laser on her. That. So I would suggest this is not required for people, but this is what I've been doing uh, quite a bit of. And then uh, study model will be recommended. A 3D video, if you can do that, that'll be that'll be good. We do it to do your comprehensive examination. And then if there's if there's uh, pocketing, if there's high DNA bacteriological germ count, your biological count, then we may recommend laser and endoscopy uh, with possible possibly in the body with her, with her. We did do endoscopy and laser and we have put we have her on azithromycin uh, to uh, uh, to control the high germ count which I'll show you. And she does have an orthotic and we use the Perio Protect is a is a uh, antibacterial tray, custom tray that allows you to apply a, um, a gel that contains hydrogen peroxide. The patient uses at home, yes. Uh, I don't have any, we couldn't give you the information there. It's just ask the person in the back. So we found it to be very, very useful. And uh, in telling the patients, look, you have a bacterial problem. It's not your fault. It's been in the gums all these years. This is why you have, the, you have what you have. And uh, this, this is what I suggest we do. All right? Okay, so, but if you have any questions about any of this, I'd be very happy to talk to you about that. Prayer protect is a, it's not agreeable. It's not something that everybody does. I happen to, to like it because you allow me to put some kind of a control over the regrowth of germs after I treated uh, the patient for high, high uh, germ count. Okay, uh, uh, to, in my hands it has worked very well with my patients in terms of preventing the need for future future re uh, re replaning, future re inflammation. So, so, uh, so I like it. Uh, 
and then so the patient will wear the first tray until the surgery, and then after after we've done the uh, pinhole, we wait six weeks, then we do another step because the gum architecture has changed. Okay, so we incorporate orthotics and, and the, this period protect custom tray antibacterial application device uh, quite quite often. We have found good, good, good results for that. And of course, you have pre-surgical evaluation and prophylaxis um, uh, with, with hygienists. The hygienists uh, would uh, always see the patient before any surgery to kind of clean everything up first. And do whatever photos are necessary. We do, we do a lot of photos. So uh, this is what she did with us back in September. This is her, we did four, four and five rope on number six. And so this is, uh, this is uh, this, the next day, the same day as the surgery. This is the pinhole. Look what it looks like the first day. Okay, this is what you will be doing yourself as, your, as one of your first patients. Do one of these cases first. The upper right, my cuspid area, is the easiest, easiest case to do. Okay, upper right, upper left. So, and then, uh, and the next day, and then about uh, three days later, like this, and then about a week later, here, and then uh, three weeks later, and then about, about six weeks later. So we'll be doing this area here. This is a trio scan. If you're interested, Young Dental can uh, supply you with one. How much does it cost? Oh, well, <clears throat> the promotion ends today, but uh, you can get the trio four for eighteen thousand uh, with the laptop. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. So I know it's quite a bit of investment, but in terms of case acceptance, it's excellent, excellent, excellent uh, return on investment. I cannot recommend it high enough, okay? If you're, in, if you're in the position to do that, I would definitely recommend because you can do this kind of thing to show before and afters. Not only pinhole, but other procedures that you have. So it's very, very good. This surgery will be, we'll be looking at number six, I mean number 11, probably 13. Right now, Dr. Liao is removing the, uh, the composites so that this will be exposed. We remove all the composites, all of it. All of it, don't leave anything behind. Composites it does not uh, allow gums to grow into, in other words, gums want to grow into what? Nitrogen structure. So, so you don't want to leave anything behind. Besides, whatever you leave behind could be infected. It can be a source of infection. All right, so there we go. All right, so now let's get to the other things. I don't want to go on and on and on. So let's, let's go to the first study. So it was published in the International Journal of Periodontics uh, and Restorative Dentistry, 2012. And this is the patient that they highlighted. This is Caesar. And, uh, and, this, and this was the study. And this is Caesar's case before we, before we did it in 2005. Now, and then we reported this picture was three years later, right here. Now we have, we have, uh, we have, uh, what, 16-year uh, result right here. From here to here, 16 years later. Okay, so uh, this, we will submit this case for our next article on the 14-year study. Okay, so now before we get, before we move on, we need to really understand the middle classification uh, for, for assessing gingival recession. Really get that down. So, class one is where you have recession, no matter how much, but there's attached tissue. In other words, the probe cannot go all the way to the mucosa. That'll be a class one, okay? And uh, it doesn't matter if the class one is three or four, five millimeters, it is still a class one. Class two is a little bit more complicated. Class two is where the gum, the, the gum line 
does not have keratinized attached tissue. These teeth must be treated because there's no seal. It's not an impermeable barrier. There's bacteria going through here on a constant basis, going into the body, making this worse. And the patient should definitely be told they need to have this treated to prevent further bone loss underneath. Okay? This is not something that's optional. It is not going to treat the problem by putting a filling in. So now that you know how to do pinhole, you have the professional application of saying, you know, Mrs. Jones, you need to get this done. So this is class two. Class one is here. Class two, now both class one and class two, the propelli are intact. Well, you have recession, and you have papillae, loss of papilla, that automatically becomes class three. Class three, we don't have the same predictability of results because of the interproximal loss of bone. Okay, so our, our good results, our predictability of what we get, full root coverage, are, are with the class one and class two cases. So if you see a papilla, you see a dark triangle, scale back on your presentation of full coverage. The root coverage is going to be much less, much less predictable. So class one, papilla intact, but you have recession with attached tissue. Class two, papilla intact, no attached tissue. Class three, papilla not present. This is Jody. She looked perfectly normal. You, you, you saw her. Okay, now basically, you don't have a whole, it, we, we don't have pockets that's really deep. And it looks pretty, pretty healthy. Okay. But you have this high germ count with a DNA test. High, above, above high risk, pocket movement to the balance. Tifosythia high, Tifosythia denticola high, and th on this group, Propertella intermedia high, Fabimonas micra high, uh, F um, creatum high. These are less toxic, but these, they're all three. You will suspect that. My theory is that having this kind of high count maybe predisposes her to gum recession. Overbrush, and it doesn't heal quite right. right. So it's just a kind of uh, uh, where's Jean? Is Jean here? Yeah. Jean, my sister put it together for me. So I think I'll make it a little ugly and make it a little clarifying. <laughs> it's going into where? The class 2 Miller, where you have no attached tissue. So these are available to you guys if you want. So, so there's some uh, the, the, uh, there's some diagrams uh, that that's a uh, Put forward by the um, as, uh, by the uh, by, by the um, Academy of Periodontology. So we're using that concept and duplicated it exactly, but we put recession here. So you have teeth with recession, and that becomes the the source of the of bacterial infestation going through the circulatory system, and uh, and expose the patients to cardiovascular diseases and diabetes risk of arthritis at um, uh, pre-birth, pre and then respiratory infections, and so on and so forth. So this is what we show the patients. All right, this study then, it's a 33-month study. This is for this first study involved 43 patients, 121 sites, 85 of which were class one, class two, and 36 were class threes. So, the mean recession was 3.4 millimeters. So they were not uh, slight recession. They were basically uh, uh, larger than three or more. Okay, for the class one and class two sites. So what's class one and class two? What does it have in common? Papilla, right? So if you see papilla, automatically with recession, you can tell yourself that you have a 81% chance 80% chance of getting full coverage. 
Okay? You're pretty confident of that. Does it mean 100%? Doesn't mean that you can say, oh, of course I get it. There you go. 80% of the time I'll get it to where we want it. Provided there's no, no, no defect that's artificially made, like by, by past composites or, or abstraction. Okay? But the critical CEG would have been had it not been for the abstraction or the or the build. So so this is good. So 80% of the time we can get full coverage for this class one, class two. Now I'll give you a statistic that's not apparent on the article. On the, when you don't have full coverage, 90% of the time, you get 90% coverage. So if you're short of the, 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 the clinical uh, CEJ, you're gonna be close, most of the time. So you're not gonna be far off, okay? Now if you haven't given that, I'll give you another statistic that, that you can think about. On the upper, actually, we put all the cases together. On the upper, recessions in front of in, in, in the post area, uh, uh, we get actually 90%. Close to 90% full coverage. On the lowers, interior-wise, we get about 70%. That's just the structure of the, of the area, the thin tissue and so on. So you have to be uh, thinking of uh, on the lowers, you won't get the kind of full coverage that you would generally expect to get. So upper is 90, lower is a what? 70, so average by 80. Okay? So keep that in mind as you present cases and talk to patients. So 81.2%, that's the key here. So this is the table that shows how the how class one class twos end up with 80.2% 80, 80 coverage. And so I told you about the split mouse study of 38 patients uh, that, will, that will be published uh, and uh, the, the interesting stat I want to show you is that it was measured that um, when, when the chairman of the department was doing CT graphs, which of course you know is the golden standard, right? Gold standard. So the surgery time they actually was 24 minutes, but the surgery time was additional 22 minutes. So the surgery time with pinhole is about the same, 22.8 and 24.5, comparing, comparing CT graphs with pinhole. Now we're doing one or two things over here. We're not doing four arches and so on. So, so, so in terms of the time, time spent comparing pinhole with CT graphs, uh, this is about, uh, about the same. But the surgery time is what made CT graphs take longer. Okay, so that's, a, that's probably common sense, right? We don't suture it, this is a long time. So University of Buffalo then is, uh, we'll look at this study published in October. So look forward to having that. So I'm gonna show you a one minute, one minute video of a, of a seven minute operation. This is a patient who lost in the last minute. He says, I'll be, I'll be doing a, uh, a, a commercial on national TV. When I smile, you see a little, uh, my, my cuspid protrude uh, with, without a gum line. So can you do it for me? I said, yeah, sure. Uh, but I cannot do it today. He says, oh, please, 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 I can get this done today. So I said, okay, I'll do it for you, provided you follow me <coughs> to the meeting I'll be having at the San Fernando Valley Dental Society. And you can be my testimonial. So he agreed, so, we, so I did this operation in seven minutes. And I took some shortcuts, of course, because I don't want you to follow in the beginning. After you do your full cases, after you do a bunch of cases, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> but uh, so, so we use one pin hole, we use the instruments, we loosen the tissue, and then and bring it down here, put the collagen in, underneath the papilla. Put the collagen underneath the papilla. Write that down, memorize it. Don't put it anywhere else. Papillas uh, elevated, there's a space between uh, the